Hello again, my name is Steve Hillis and this is the last in a series of videos on methodology and sociology. In this video, we're going to compare and contrast some uh, popular research methods, talk about their strengths, weaknesses, advantages, and disadvantages. First of all, though, let's deal with a couple related issues. Uh, we're going to start with making a distinction between cross-sectional research designs versus longitudinal research designs. Cross-sectional research designs are like taking a snapshot, a frozen picture of the social world. You gather data at one time, or at least over a very short period of time. For example, if you do a, a survey and uh, uh, you take it over, I don't know, a week or two weeks, one time asking a certain group of people one set of questions. That is a classic example of cross-sectional research. Now, cross-sectional research can be very, very useful for coming up with descriptive data, uh, basically uh, trying to see what's going on in the social world and describe it in an accurate way. On the other hand, cross-sectional research is usually not appropriate for testing causal theories, and it's usually completely inappropriate for studying change over longer periods of time, studying long-term trends and more generally studying social change. There, if you're interested in studying or testing causal theories, if you're interested in uh, studying social change over time, uh, trends over time, and so forth, you're much better off doing longitudinal research. Longitudinal research uh, does, uh, gathers data, does research over an extended period of time. Now, sometimes you're studying the exact same group of people. The same sample of people is repeatedly studied over months, perhaps years, even decades. That's one possibility. The other possibility is you study similar samples of people. People who were sampled in a similar way using the same sampling uh, designs. Trying to get samples that were very similar to each other and then comparing those different samples at different points in time over an extended period of time to see how their behavior might change or how they react to some stimuli or some change in their environment. Now, the clear advantage using longitudinal research is, is that you can study cause and effect relationships, test causal theories much more rigorously than with cross-sectional analysis. You can deal with thorny issues like trying to figure out what's causing what, all that stuff about figuring out which way the arrow of causation points. Longitudinal research will give you a lot better uh, position to deal with that. Cross-sectional research virtually, uh, you're just hand-waving at that problem. Now, uh, it also will give you a, a strong advantage when you're looking at uh, trying to study long-term trends or uh, patterns of change. Uh, clearly, if that's what you're interested in, go with longitudinal research. But I do want to point out that longitudinal research has its own limitations or problems. And let me just mention a couple of them. First of all, it's very costly. And in a lot of cases, you simply may not have the money, the manpower, the subjects to do it, even if you want to. Secondly, uh, you may run into serious sampling problems over time, which undermine your external validity. There's a problem called uh, sampling mortality or morbidity. You start out with a random sample. You really want to talk about some larger population of people. You work really hard to get a representative sample. And then you want to study that same sample over time. You want to do longitudinal research on them. But then, over time, people literally die off or they drop out of the sample, they stop cooperating, they go to jail, they disappear, whatever. The sample changes and shrinks over time. The whole logic of this longitudinal research is to compare the same group of people at different points in time. But the sample is changing. This undermines your internal validity and also, if you started out with a good representative sample to start out with, well then it begins to undermine your external validity as well. So these are problems that you may have to cope with if you do longitudinal research. And sometimes longitudinal research, in spite of your best efforts, may not work as well as you hope. Now, one other issue we should touch on is the distinction between quantitative and qualitative research methods. Quantitative research involves research where you're gathering some kind of, quanti uh, some kind of quantitative data. Uh, you're counting things. You're uh, measuring things in such a way that you can put numbers on things. As a result of that, you can do lots of statistical and sometimes other mathematical analysis on your data. 
The advantage is, is that you can quantify your results. You can do statistical tests. You can try to figure out how strong effects are. Uh, perhaps your research becomes more uh, rigorous. Certainly your statistical analysis becomes more rigorous. You're better able to make fine distinctions between various phenomena or effects that you're studying. And again, you can actually put numbers on things, which a lot of times people place a great premium on. Uh, those are some of the advantages with quantitative research, but quantitative research is not perfect. Some things are just inherently difficult to quantify. And for that matter, quantify, uh, using quantitative approaches a lot of times forces you to only look at things that you have planned to look at and measure in a very specific way. It forces you to only look at things that you can measure easily in highly quantitative ways. There may be other disadvantages as well, but let's move on. Qualitative research is really a very different approach. It's what we do when we do observational research in microsociology or what anthropologists do when they do uh, ethnographic research or field research. You go out into the real world and you observe people. Now, sometimes you actually do make uh, observations that can be quantified, but in many cases your observational data is words, observations, pictures, recordings, sounds. It's things that are difficult, perhaps even impossible, to quantify very much. Now you're still engaged in measurement, but a lot of that measurement, uh, that data generation and creation, is a different kind of data. It's qualitative data. You're basically describing what you're looking at in very rich ways. You're talking to people and recording what they're saying but you're not literally measuring things in very, very quantitative terms. This again has advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantages is, are, are excuse me, that you are really ill prepared to do the kind of rigorous statistical analysis that you would be if you used uh, quantitative approaches. And that may limit your internal validity. It's certainly going to limit your ability to do rigorous analysis, to interpret your results in extremely rigorous ways and so forth. Ultimately, you're, at worst, your research may become a little more fuzzy. You may have problems with, uh, with measurement reliability, measurement validity. There may be some issues there. And ultimately, it may be harder to draw firm, hard conclusions in terms of testing causal theories. A lot of times people say that qualitative methods may be uh, less well suited to testing causal theories, although not everybody buys into that argument. Uh, still, it's a fairly widespread uh, point of view in terms of methodology. At any rate, the point is, is that qualitative research clearly has some possible disadvantages, but it also has very clear advantages. First of all, you can gather tremendous amounts of rich, complex data if you keep your eyes open, if you uh, are a very keen observer, if you plan ahead. It turns out that uh, uh, observational research people have come up with a wide variety of techniques and tricks and tools to really record a tremendous amount of details about what they're observing. And in the process, you can come up with a rich, theoretically based description of social reality. Now, that itself is worthwhile. And sometimes you can use that to test causal theories, and sometimes you may be able to do it in fairly rigorous ways. If nothing else, though, you gather tremendous amounts of data, and you do get a better sense of what you're studying, maybe a broader picture than you might come up with with quant quantitative research. And at the same time, you may be better suited to be able to use qualitative research in the beginning to formulate your theories and formulate your research questions. In other words, Qualitative research sometimes can be much more appropriate, appropriate than quantitative research in the early stages of research, when you're first trying to figure out what to study, how to study it, what, uh, what your theoretical arguments are. A lot of times going out and becoming a member of a group, interacting with them, watching them, interviewing them, and just generally collecting lots of qualitative data about them is a really good starting place to even begin to study them in more rigorous or at least more quantitative ways.